Hi everybody, I'm Jack the Rambling Rack and Turn. I hope that you're doing well. I hope you're having a great weekend. The library tour is continuing as we head towards what's sort of an anomaly of a shelf in my family library. And that's because almost nowhere are books organized alphabetically. Uh, sometimes to the pleasure of my wife or I, but we, we always find what we're looking for. Um, but usually it's organized by publisher and that's so that we can front and back double stack the books and if they're the same publisher, the same size and it creates like nice space efficiency. Uh, but there's this one anomaly of a shelf where we don't have enough books from any one publisher and so they're grouped together and a bunch of them start with the last letter W. So we've got P.G. Woodhouse, we've got Virginia Woolf, we have uh, the Richard Wilbur translations of Racine and Moliere, and then we've got this other writer mixed in there. So let's explore. We'll start off with Virginia Woolf and the great Mrs. Dalloway, a modernist masterpiece. Maybe my favorite modernist book to read. Um, it's just such a, it's such an inventive book. It is playful. The way in which Wolf is just fluidly jumping from mind to mind for her characters. Um, and it's, for me, it's a calming book, despite the personal and, you know, personal tragedies of the characters, the public tragedy of, you know, what's going on within the book. Um, it's, it's a pleasurable book to read. I reread it in March and, uh, it was, it was just fantastic to jump back into it. Um, up next, we have To the Lighthouse, often sort of contending with Mrs. Dalloway in terms of what people are, you know, like pushing up as the best Virginia Woolf novel. Uh, and this is a fantastic book as well. I, I think I enjoy Mrs. Dalloway more, but To the Lighthouse is just an absolutely amazing book and one that I highly, highly recommend. Again, deep into modernism, steeped in it. And then Between the Acts, a later book um, published in 1940 or 1941, I can't recall, but... Um, a book that feels much more formal in terms of not just its structure, but the narrative, the ways in which Wolf is being experimental feels more formal and consequently less fluid. Um, and so th this isn't a book that I absolutely love the way that I absolutely love Mrs. Dowling to the Lighthouse, but it, it's a fascinating book and it's a, it's a really interesting book to read and to, to see Virginia Woolf trying something a little different from some of her other books. Uh, but again another great book and then we have her essays and I'm a huge proponent of the essays of Virginia Woolf I want to like collect all of them and read all of them the best of many of the best of them are in the common reader but she was writing essays and criticism and reviews and like almost short little notices for all sorts of works um, not just fiction across decades and many of many of her ideas around fiction around writing around humanity um, are all just filling these essays and, and they're really fascinating um, and she's just a tremendous writer in every respect it doesn't matter <laughs> what what form her writing is taking she's a beautiful and amazing writer so volume 2 is 1912 to 1918 this is a great volume uh, it really is sort of the um, the rising action for Virginia Woolf in terms of her mind as a critic her mind as a writer uh, and, and, and the ways she's, we can see her probing and exploring what it is she loves about writing, what it is she loves about literature, uh, what it is she loves about, you know, the, the expression of the human consciousness and artistic expression, and how she's finding her way um, towards, you know, the, the summits she's going to attain as a writer. And summits that she very much reaches within Volume 3, uh, 1919 to 1924. Just, <laughs> this of course parallels, uh, you know, her writing as she's, Mrs. Dalloway is, is being released and such. Um, towards the end of this, but it's it's a fantastic volume of essays and one that really does illuminate um, not just her nonfiction but modernism as a whole. And then, of course, there are the letters of Virginia Woolf. So I have volume two here, uh, 1912 to 1922, and then volume three, 1923 to 1928. Fabulous letter writer. These illuminate, you know, her writing and and the the thought behind her criticism and essays, but they're also uh, there's a different sensibility within them. Whereas in Mrs. Dalloway, she's such a confident writer. And as a critic, she could be a very confident critic. And she just moves with, with this sense of, of, of absolute perfect, you know, placement within, within her space and her time. And she gets that. Within the letters, we see a very different person. We see the very personal Virginia Woolf. Um, but we also see the passionate Virginia Woolf. Um, the, the way she interacts with uh, her husband, Leonard, um, and also then Vita Sackville West, Th those letters are, are very illuminating in terms, again, of a different side of who she is. The doubts she had around um, Mrs. Dalloway and, and the revisions she was working on. It's great to have those. So that's our, the first of our great W writers. And then you're going to notice we have that anomaly I mentioned, and that's because 
this writer shares a publisher with Virginia Woolf. I mentioned that we, we organized by publisher. That would be the great Italo Calvino. So the non-existent knight and the cloven viscount, two sort of novellas, each of which is amazing. Um, the non-existent knight is this almost postmodern paradistic send up of the chivalric ideal, the great crusader middle ages knight. Um, and it's just fascinating. The, it, you know, there's this amazing uh, female character within it who might be a great warrior. We don't know. Um, and it, it's just, it's a really fun book to read. The Cloven Viscount is pretty scary. Uh, it's sort of a Jekyll and Hyde type idea where we have a, a, a nobleman who's cut in half and it's his good and bad sides. And it, it goes to some frightening uh, places, but it's interesting how Calvino ties it together at the end um, in, a, in a very interesting way. Then I have The Baron in the Trees, which comes highly recommended from Tom L.A. Books. Uh, this is actually purchased for me by my wife. And so I look forward to reading this very soon. Cosmic Comics. Uh, these are short stories that sort of playfully explore um, the beginning of the universe, <laughs> particles, uh, quantum fluctuations, the formation of planets, uh, solar systems, life, and the, the, the good ones are very fun. The weaker ones are just sort of like, they're not ridiculous, they just fall flat. They're two-dimensional. There we go. Um, they exist on a plane that's not very fun. So the Cosmic Comics, I read this in December, and I'll link that video in the description box below. T-Zero, which is a sequel to Cosmic Comics. I'll be reading this. Um, I just wanted to kind of get a different sense of Calvino um, after uh, Cosmic Comics. Invisible Cities, which is so far by far my favorite of Calvino's works. I love this book. I love to read it. This is a book that is uh, supposedly Marco Polo telling uh, uh, the Khan, uh, Kupa Khan, all about these different cities. And the cities, you know, aren't necessarily named, some of them. Uh, but they, they have these attributes, um, and they're organized in an interesting way where they're organized sort of by theme. They're not, it's not just like cities in Italy and then cities in, uh, Turkey and cities, you know, here and there. It's cities in desire, cities in signs, cities in eyes, thin cities, uh, cities in names, cities in the dead, um, continuous cities, hidden cities. And so those themes are interesting. And so I, I've read this book more than once and I've read it like straight through, but I've also done sort of a Julio Cortazar hopscotch type thing where I go and read uh, the first uh, cities and memory and I read all of the cities and memory stories. So one, two, three, four, five, and work through all of the cities and memory. And then after that, it's cities and desire. So I read all of the cities and desire um, sections and you can do that. It's it's numbered sort of on the right for you to be able to identify what what the um, order is of those themes and read it and that gives a very different sense uh, for the book. So I love this one. It's it's my favorite Calvino. And then if on a winter's night a traveler, the hyper postmodernist experimental avant garde, <laughs> where there's the sort of parallel. You are reading a book by Italo Calvino. <laughs> Uh, and then alternating with the narrative of this book that the reader within the novel is supposedly reading. Um, so, f fascinating. And then uh, more um, stories from Calvino, Difficult Loves. Not, uh, not supposedly dealing with physics and astrobiology and thermodynamics and such, the way Cosmic Comics and T-Zero are, but more just uh, so somewhat fantastic, somewhat fabulous. Uh, magical real <laughs> um, stories. So that was our interloper. And then we have the Wilbur translations. And Richard Wilbur was an amazing uh, poet in the, uh, here in, the, in English, but he was also an amazing translator of French drama, specifically Jean Racine and Moliere. So I have uh, Phaedra, which I read last year. I'll link that video in the description box. This is a great tragedy. Uh, dealing with uh, Phaedra, who is in love with her stepson Hippolytus, Hippolytus and uh, the tragedies that ensue there. It's based on a, a Greek myth and Greek tragedy. Uh, Euripides wrote Hippolytus. And then we have uh, Andromach. Uh, this one is dynamite. I think this, this play by Racine, this tragedy, and the translation by Wilbur are fantastic. I think this is the first Richard Wilbur translation I ever read. I absolutely loved it. 
Um, so this takes place after the Trojan War. Andromache is the widow of Hector. Uh, you know, she's seeing the butchery of Trojans, including Trojan children. And now she is trying to sort of find a way forward for her, for her, her daughter, um, as, you know, absolute slaughter has been enacted around them and the ultimate, you know, Greek tragic elements that occur. Uh, again, based in Greek myth, but what Racine does and what Wilbur then does for Racine's poetry to bring it in translation is amazing. Um, from Moliere, we have The Misanthrope, which is great. And then Tartuffe, I, re I read Tartuffe last May, uh, May 2020, so I'll link that in the description box below. These are two of probably Moliere's best plays. Um, certainly The Misanthrope is, is an absolute masterpiece and, and manages to be quite funny. Then School for Wives and the Learned Ladies. And these, uh, these are um, not quite at the level of Tartuffe, I would say. There, there's, there's sort of this clear like Moliere at the summit of his power. And then there's Tartuffe, which is very strong uh, and very interesting. And then there's Moliere sort of as, as a, a, you know, the best comic playwright of his generation and of maybe his century. And that's this one where he, he's very strong, but he's not necessarily like a world conqueror the way he is in his masterpieces. Um, and then Don Juan, which I have not read, but could be on that like Pantheon list. I'm lo certainly looking forward to reading this. Uh, then we have the last of those great W writers, P.G. Woodhouse. So The World of Jeeves, this is a great publication that collects um, all the short stories. So those are, I'll show a later um, publisher series, uh, but those are fantastic. They sort of set the template for Jeeves where Bertie Wooster and uh, his uh, valet Jeeves. Wooster is this wealthy young man who's an absolute fool, who doesn't want to get married, who's in and out of love. Um, think Romeo from Romeo and Juliet at the very beginning, except not a tragedy. Uh, and if Mercutio, instead of being like amped up and you know somewhat murder murderous, was instead really resourceful and intelligent and like a, a team player, um, that's what you get with with all of the Jeeves and Wooster novels. Wooster is in some situation. Jeeves offers to help get him out of it. Wooster, so, you know, suddenly everything seems to fall apart. The plan, ridiculous as always, is just a disaster. But in the end, Jeeves bails them out and Wooster's just like so glad to still be a bachelor, still be wealthy, still be young and, and have his friends. Um, and so that's what, that's what happens over and over and over and over, but they're just absolutely hysterical. Um, so the, the world of Jeeves is a great one that collects all the stories. Those are published, um, so that I then have a huge number from the Arrow Books publication. Those are published in the Arrow Books publications as, what, Stiff Upper, no, uh, The Inimitable Jeeves, Carry On Jeeves, and Very Good Jeeves. Uh, but then there are all of the Jeeves and Wooster novels. So thank you, Jeeves. Right ho, Jeeves. The Code of the Woosters, this is a different publisher, but. Joy in the Morning and um, The Mating Season are probably the two funniest novels in my reading. Uh, they, they really perfect that sense of humor. And <laughs> we get some of Bertie Wooster's friends who are even bigger fools than he is. Uh, there's T uh, Tubby Klossop. Um, there's like characters, <laughs> they're, they're, they, some are gamblers, some are sportsmen, some are scientists. And the scientists all are always like the biggest fools of the group. Uh, Ring for Jeeves, you can see the great disguises involved. Jeeves in the feudal spirit. Um, here we have Stilton Cheeserite is, is in, involved. Uh, and there's a darts tournament. <laughs> Jeeves in the offing. Stiff upper lip Jeeves. Um, and uh, <laughs> There's an errand of mercy, uh, Gussie Finknoddle, the Reverend Stinker Pinker, uh, and Sir Watkin Bassett, JP, enemy to everything the Woosters hold dear, to say nothing of his daughter Madeline and Roderick Spode, now raised to the peerage. And so there are, while many of the characters remain the same, like, you know, fools throughout the books, there are, like, characters around them who change, um, notably Bertie's aunts uh, changed. And then, uh, much obliged to Jeeves. Ants Art and Gentlemen, the last of the great Jeeves and Wooster novels from Woodhouse. 
And then I have one standalone, um, Piccadilly Gym, which I think is very funny. It's, it feels different. It, it feels, Piccadilly Gym is very, the character, um, uh, Jimmy Crocker, he feels like a birdie wooster, but he doesn't really have a Jeeves to go with them. Um, and he, he's, this one maybe feels like it could have been influencing uh, Kingsley Amos a little bit more um, than just the, the Jeeves and Wooster novels. I don't have the Blandings novels. I don't know if those are any good. I'm sure they're excellent. I've just never read them. And then I do have one, Sebastian Falk's um, Jeeves and the Wedding Bells. But to finish off, I also have uh, the dark version of the Jeeves and Wooster series, which is the um, Charlie Mordecai books by Kirill uh, Bonfiglioli. Uh, so don't point that thing at me. Uh, something nasty in the woodshed after you with the pistol. And these are books uh, where we have a sort of a little bit older man. He's not quite as young as Bertie Wooster, uh, who's not necessarily like a, a, a great guy. Um, Charlie Mordecai is not, he, he's a bad dude. Uh, but he also, he's involved in like, like Wooster wants to pull off some romantic conquest for his friend, or he wants to make a killing on a boy's foot race type thing. He's not actually perpetrating art, the, art, art the, um, theft or uh, like, you know, mass embezzlement or anything. <laughs> Uh, Charlie Mordecai is involved in pretty bad stuff, uh, but he also has a manservant who is terrifying. Uh, Jockstrap. Jockstrap is Jeeves. Uh, if Jeeves had done some time in like uh, the special forces or something, that's he. He has the efficiency, the ability to think on his feet and get through any situation that Jeeves does. But he's also like a stone cold killer unlike Jeeves. So uh, these books are sort of interesting, um, also sort of terrifying. So that was the W shelf. I guess that's what I'll dub it. And I don't know where we'll be next weekend. So again, I hope everybody's doing well. Thanks.